right, so let's get the show going. Uh, let's take a minute here to allow ourselves to absorb this. This is really uh, quite an amazing supercharged chamber. Uh, I hope you'll take a second to just feel that because when you take that second, um, it'll give me an opportunity to marvel at the previous talk because uh, one of the reasons uh, I think that I have more or less stalked Philip K. Dick's exegesis, which is a, we'll just call it a million word march. How about that? It's about 9,000 pages. Nobody's really sure because they get too dizzy by the time they get to the end of it to really know how many there are. Um, one of the reasons why I think I've stalked that work, which I have stalked for the past 15 years, is because of the uh, purchase that his story of falling apart and yes, actually for a while, falling to pieces uh, and reconstructing himself had for me uh, in my experience in the upper Amazon where I was uh, to follow up with the previous speaker, uh, blessed to be healed through indigenous healing practices of a lifelong inflammation known as asthma, which had been utterly debilitating. And what I learned in that experience and in those practices since, which is part of the inflammation was the inflammation of the self. So uh, why is the inflammation of the self a uh, particular problem today? Uh, there's a wonderful quote here uh, from Herbert Simon. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a really fascinating thinker from the 50s and 60s. Uh, I'm a uh, rhetorician by trade, which means I humbly put myself in the tradition of Empedocles and Gorgias and Pythagoras and Plato and Aristotle and Shankara and Maria Sabina and Allen Ginsberg and Norma Pandoro, all of whom are looking for the space of all possible words. What can you do to words? What do words do to you, right? How can we transmit our culture, as our first speaker spoke, through words? And Herbert Simon, around the uh, late 1960s, already saw, if you will, the writing on the wall, if you can uh, follow me there, that he saw these giant, remember what a computer liked, looked like in the 1960s, trash can sized tape uh, uh, spools going back and forth with very impressive looking blinking lights, right? Simon was one of the real pioneers in early computation, and he saw that as increasingly the world became composed of information rather than just matter, right? that we were going to face what he called a crisis of, att of attention. And he said, what information consumes is rather obvious. It consumes the attention of its recipients. We could think about that maybe in a certain way as a sort of Pac-Man theory of information, if you think back to the early arcade game, that information gobbles away at our attention. And we feel that we're in the position to be the DJ, to be the arbiter of information. But what Simon was pointing to was this sense that uh, information actually consumes our sense of self. Now, that may seem like bad news, but in fact, it's quite good news. So how does Philip K. Dick teach us about this inflammation of the self? Philip K. Dick, as you probably know, was a very prolific author, born in 1928, died in 1982. Uh, I believe somewhere around 11 of his films are either in production or rumored to be in production based on his work. And uh, Dick's exegesis grew out of an impetus of experiencing himself basically being consumed by information. Uh, and he, the situation was as follows. So we, uh, many of us have probably had uh, painful oral surgery or pa experienced extraordinary pain of some kind. And Dick had had oral surgery earlier that day and he was in the uncomfortable situation of waiting in his apartment for the pharmacy to deliver his medicine, right? And so you can imagine the situation. He was listening, in fact, as he records in the exegesis, uh, he was listening to the Beatles' Strawberry Fields Forever, and he was listening to the sound between the notes of Strawberry Fields Forever, because these moments of when is the doorbell going to ring were pulling on him as, you know, under the species of eternity, as we said, right? You know, he was, as, you know, maybe a, a Lower East Side resident uh, once said, 
waiting on the man, right? So he was waiting for just some relief from this tremendous, even visionary pain that he was having. And he was so excited when he heard the doorbell ring that he, he went to the door and he opened the door and he looked out the door. Now this is not what he saw. This is the drawing of uh, the great comics illustrator uh, Robert Crumb of this episode. And he saw the fish-shaped necklace around the neck of the delivery girl who had the Darvon in a small white paper bag to deliver to him. When he looked at the fish-shaped network, by his own account, he was hit with a blinding flash of information. Right? Now, of course, at this point, you know, Phil's friends at the time, of course, said, sure you will, Phil, you know, uh, take another Darvon, right? You know, which was what was in the bag. But uh, what's interesting about it and the enigma that it poses for a rhetorician is that PKD pr proceeded to write, as I said, almost 9,000 pages about this experience. And so I wanted to ask the question, who, who and why would someone write 9,000 pages about this experience? So. You see this is folder 79. After you get through some of the other folders, you get to folder 79. Um, now what's interesting about this is that PKD took his own experience extraordinarily seriously. And, um, but he also had remarkable powers of humor and skepticism, right? He was the first to make fun of his own experiences. But he wouldn't let go to the idea and the feeling that something had happened, right? Now, and that something that happened, he calls by folder 79, pure consciousness. Now, this is the opportunity to maybe draw a distinction and to experience for ourselves the distinction between what PKD might have meant by pure consciousness and our ordinary state of consciousness, right? Now, pure consciousness is not just that state where we're slammed by or nailed by information, as PKD put it. It is, in fact, the distinction that a lot of philosophers would draw, right, between a particular moment of a particular being and being itself. Or for ourselves, we can think about it as the distinction between the content of our consciousness and consciousness itself. Now, one of our previous speakers said that his practice of meditation and his practice of medicine were, in fact, one and the same. And it's in the practice of meditation, which we all did together just for a second, as we allowed uh, this incredible space to actually arrive for ourselves, rather than uh, block it with all the little stories we're telling in our own heads all the time, that is the experience of pure consciousness. Now, there was plenty of competition to crowd in on pure consciousness because, remember, Dick was a contemporary of Herbert Simon. Since Herbert Simon and Philip K. Dick, of course, the world has just become more and more coded and covered and swarming with information like one of Jason Silva's videos, right? In other words, our lives are composed more and more of informational events and transactions. But already by the time uh, Dick was starting to write between 74 and 82, he was drawing on all of those streams of information that were available to him to try to figure out what had happened to him, right? This is a, a little bit of the Dead Sea Scrolls which Dick was in particularly uh, impressed with. This is the print volume of the exegesis that's available to you. It's about 1,000 pages. Um, it's really an amazing book for investigating uh, this fantastic word, bibliomancy, right? Which is just the technique that happened to Augustine in his, youth, in his youth, where you open a book and you find a passage and it seems to speak to you. This is one of the most powerful books for such an event that you can choose in part because it absolutely lacks a spine, as they call it in Hollywood. There's no fundamental uh, thread that connects this hero's journey, and that is exactly what PKD will discover. Something strange happened to me, he writes. I burned out. I could not think in complete sentences. I'd begin a sentence of thought, and it would end in the middle. It was as if I had used up all of my thoughts, unquote. Now this sounds horrible to us because we identify with our thoughts. But if we're trying to arrive at pure consciousness, then it's precisely this ability to exhaust our thoughts that it seems that PKD was engaging in in writing these 9,000 pages. In other words, 
Why did he write 9,000 pages? Because he had to. Now, Joseph Campbell has a lovely moment, uh, lovely passage uh, to describe this. It says, the individual no longer resists the self-annihilation that is prerequisite to rebirth and the realization of truth, and so becomes ripe at last for the great at one mint. Right, nice pun with atonement. His personal ambitions being totally dissolved, he becomes, that is to say, an anonymity. Now, precisely at this moment, PKD, Philip K. Dick, started to write a novel called Vallis. In it, he treated himself as a fictional character. There are two versions of himself in that book, one named Horse Lover Fat, which is a very uh, loosely veiled pseudonym for uh, Philip K. Dick, and one named Philip K. Dick. What he discovered is that both of them were fictions. Now, when he discovered that, he discovered that by essentially in this daily writing practice, right? We, we may discuss meditation, but Dick was dissolving himself into language, writing up to 100 pages a night, at, even while he wrote eight novels between 1974 and 1982. So the difference between PKD and his language gradually began to disappear. He became nothing but pure information. And at the time, he drew on this line from the Gospel of Thomas. When you make the two one, and you make the inside like the outside, and the outside like the inside, in other words, you make yourself a Mobius strip, and the above like the below, then you will enter the kingdom. It was precisely by losing himself in this vast stream of information that Dick achieved his healing. And his healing occurred like this. Now this absolute total exhaustion of thoughts in me seems somehow related to the phosphine graphics trip. He got quite visionary effects when he saw the uh, uh, fish-shaped necklace. I had come to the end in some real and perhaps even ontological sense. Mentally, I had in fact died, right? Now that sounds horrible, but on the other end of it is, yet the next day I found myself in the magic spatial world of total freedom, a world of infinite extension. In other words, Dick had systematically and relentlessly worked through the space of all of his possible thoughts till he realized that there was this possibility or experienced this possibility of pure consciousness. And here, Dick finds himself ironically repeating uh, many of the practices that we could call the, uh, coming from the perennial philosophy. Aldous Huxley's name for that, that core framework that unites all of the world's religious traditions. It's interesting to know that uh, Campbell, Joseph Campbell, his earlier work before the hero's journey was as editor for the Gospel of Ramakrishna, who was probably the foremost uh, expositor of the uh, perennial philosophy before Huxley, expo ex you know, uh, articulating the common thread of the Muslim tradition, the Christian tradition, and the Hindu tradition. And that common thread is be without thoughts. This is the secret of meditation. Empty your mind of all thoughts. Let your heart be at peace. Now, this sounds very easy. It almost sounds like a Taoist hallmark card, right? But some of us need to write for about 9,000 pages to be capable of that. And that's precisely what PKD did. So the response to InfoQuake, the response to the fact that in the past 15 minutes, we probably produced more information than we produced in the first 800,000 years of human evolution is rather obvious. We have to ask ourselves, to whom is this information addressed? Who is this mysterious, mythical character called the hero? Is there one? Ballas in me was my own mind, was God but fallen God, my own mind creating irreal, imprisoning worlds for me, Philip K. Dick. Philip K. Dick became liberated from the fact of being this character Philip K. Dick, an experienced calm, we can practice the same. Now, just in case the thousand uh, pages or so of the print volume isn't enough for you, and you want to throw various search engines at the full Monty of uh, PKD's pink light revelation, you can go to zebrapedia.psu.edu where we have the whole thing online, and we need help to make sense of it. Come. Exhaust your thoughts with us. Thank you.